Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort, a local Champaign-Urbana peace group. I'm Carl Estabrook. We're recording this at noon on Tuesday, April 3rd, in the studios of Urbana Public Television, Urbana, Illinois. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing in accord with the Latin proverb, proprium humana ingeni est, odissi quim laserus. It's human nature to hate those you have injured. At this moment, the U.S. is making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Mideast and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a weapon against its economic rivals from Germany to China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, although most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command, an army within the army, are active in three quarters of the countries of the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. As the rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. today is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protected as they are by government and media propaganda. What we do here at Aware, at the, Aware on the Air is try to encourage our fellow citizens to oppose U.S. government killing around the world. To that end, there's a letter in the News Gazette on Sunday. When the Reagan administration began almost 40 years ago, they planned to invade Central America in imitation of the Kennedy administration's invasion of South Vietnam 20 years before that. But the Reaganites were prevented from doing so by the persistence of the anti-war movement that had grown up in the 60s. By 1969, polls showed that 70% of the public regarded the Vietnam War as fundamentally wrong and immoral rather than a mistake. So U.S. government's subversion of Central American governments could not be open, but had to be clandestine, as in the Iran-Contra affair. Twenty years later, the Bush II administration could invade Afghanistan and Iraq despite some of the largest anti-war demonstrations in history, because the Bush I administration had, quote, kicked the Vietnam syndrome, the U.S. public's opposition to criminal wars, once and for all, close quote, in the words of President G.W. Bush, referring to the first Gulf War in 1991. The persistence of the anti-war movement had been countered by administration propaganda and lies about weapons of mass destruction before the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Today, the inherent reluctance of Americans to support U.S. government wars, contrived as they are for the profits of the 1%, is countered by fantastic lies and propaganda, most notably Russiagate, with the aim of using U.S. military force to retard the economic development of Eurasia a threat to the U.S. worldwide economic hegemony. The U.S. political establishment is bent on destroying the Russian-Chinese Entente, rather than joining China's Belt and Road Initiative and Russia's Eurasian Economic Union. They're willing to kill a lot of people in Washington to set those back in the Ukraine, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in the South China Sea, and elsewhere. An informed U.S. anti-war movement is as necessary today as it has been for generations. You're watching Aware on the Air. We're talking about the war news that doesn't make its way into mainstream media. The last significant enclave held by U.S.-backed groups near the Syrian capital of Damascus collapsed last Sunday, 
with the agreement of two groups to evacuate and another to submit to Russian military police acting on behalf of President Bashar al-Assad, the legitimate government of Syria. The Syrian civil war, as it's been called, which was set up by the Obama administration by sending terrorists and head choppers into Syria to overthrow a government in Damascus that the U.S. thought was not following orders from Washington regarding the uh, distribution of oil. Uh, that war is coming to an end uh, as a result of the support of the Damascus government by Russia. The fall of eastern Ghouta, this region near the Damascus, near the capital of Syria, the fall of eastern Ghouta with a population estimated as 400,000 people is the biggest debacle suffered by U.S.-backed Islamist groups since, since the Assad regime recaptured the country's largest city, Aleppo, in December 2016. The U.S. was backing the terrorists, the jihadists, the secretly and illegally, but uh, it was generally known, uh, and it's that group that held the area near Dismask Damascus called East Ghouta, which has finally now been driven out. The largest rebel group in eastern Ghouta, Jaysh al-Islam, which controlled Duma, the biggest population center in the area, reached an agreement last Sunday on evacuating the enclave, according to the Syrian government news service. Other reports said Jaysh al-Islam, the terrorist group, the jihadist group, was still pressing for Russian military police to be introduced as a buffer force between its own fighters and Syrian army troops. Jaysh al-Islam agreed Saturday to evacuate its wind, wounded to Idlib in northwest Syria, the last province in the country under the control of Islamist forces opposed to the central government. The group was in negotiations with the Assad government through Russian mediators. It's Russian support and Russian mediation that has brought the war to an end. Two smaller rebel groups reached a full evacuation deal with Russian intermediaries, which called for the evacuation of 19,000 people to Idlib, including fighters from the Falak al-Rahman and al-Rahar al-Sham groups, their families and residents who wished to join them. Doma and the surrounding eastern Ghouta area, area, comprising eastern suburbs of Damascus, the capital of Syria, and an adjacent rural area that served as a source of food, have been under the control of rebel forces, the terrorist forces, the jihadist forces, that the Obama administration was supporting since 2013, but largely cut off from other groups fighting the Assad regime. The Syrian army stepped up its siege of the enclave in February, accompanied by heavy bombing raids by Russian airplanes, and then in March began incursions that systematically broke through rebel lines and separated the insurgents into isolated pockets that were overwhelmed or starved out one by one. The biggest breakthrough came last Friday and Saturday after rebel resistance, except in Duma itself, effectively collapsed. The southern and western portions of the Ghouta region were evacuated by rebel forces last Saturday afternoon. It's the comprehensive defeat of the U.S.-backed rebels and the consolidation of the Assad regime's control over the last area from which attacks could be mounted on the capital that underlies the evident disarray in U.S. policy in Syria. On Thursday, President Trump told a campaign-style rally in Richfield, Ohio, that U.S. forces would, quote, be coming out of Syria like very soon. Let the other people take care of it now, close quote. While the remark came in the context of Trump boasting about the success of U.S. military forces against ISIS in eastern Syria and western Iraq, his suggestion that the 2,000 U.S. troops now in Syria could soon be withdrawn contradicted the official policy of his own administration. In a speech delivered by Secretary of State Rex Tillerson barely two months ago, the administration publicly declared its intention to stay in Syria more or less indefinitely, not merely to ensure the final destruction of ISIS, but to achieve the long-standing goal of U.S. imperialist policy in the country, the ouster of the Assad regime, which is allied to Iran and Russia and its replacement by a U.S. puppet. Tillerson's pronouncement followed close on the release of a new U.S. Mil new US military strategy document 
that declared that the Pentagon was now making, uh, taking, making as its top priority not the struggle against so-called terrorist groups, but great power conflicts, particularly with Russia and China, that could erupt into major and even nuclear wars. Trump fired Tillerson on March 13th and National Security Advisor General H.R. McMaster on March 22nd. But he proposed to replace them with even more belligerent figures, CIA Director Mike Pompeo to head the State Department, and John Bolton, ambassador to the UN under the Bush administration and a major architect of the Iraq War, to replace McMaster as National Security Advisor. Accordingly, Trump's sudden prediction that U.S. forces would withdraw from Syria very soon caused consternation at the Pentagon, the State Department, the National Security Council, and the editorial pages of pro-war publications like the Washington Post and the New York Times. While the initial response of the military intelligence agencies was to dismiss Trump's comment as though it were a random treat, tweet, the remark was followed by reports revealing that the White House had put on hold some $200 million in State Department funding for stabilization projects in Syria. Tillerson had announced the new spending on roads, water, and sewer repairs in areas of eastern Syria captured from ISIS during a visit to the region in February. The Associated Press reported Friday that Trump's comment about pulling out of Syria, quote, was not a one-off, but reflected sentiments he had expressed in internal meetings with top aides for more than a month. The corporate media has responded with a barrage of commentaries denouncing Trump's comment as a surrender to Assad and to Russian President Vladimir Putin, Assad's principal backer internationally, along with Iran. The Washington Post, in particular, has devoted column after column to demanding a long-term U.S. commitment to military intervention in Syria. An Easter Sunday editorial sought to dismiss Trump's comment as, quote, the gap between the policies pursued by President Trump's administration and what the president says when he's outside the range of a teleprompter, close quote. The Washington Post editorial reported to the conflict between Trump's remark and the statements of Secretary of Defense James Mattis and other top officials while warning, this is the Washington Post, quote, the, Republic, the president's words will surely encourage Russian and Iranian hopes of driving the United States out of the country so they can entrench, the, entrench their military bases and political influence. That would pose a major threat to Israel and severely damage U.S. standing throughout the Middle East. Close quote. That's the Washington Post uh, foreign policy. Even more unflammable was an op-ed column by Josh Rogan, a member of the Washington Post editorial board, under the remarkable headline, quote, In Syria we took the oil. Now Trump's wants, Trump wants to give it to Iran, close quote. That's what the Washington Post charges. Rogan was quoting Trump's own comment about the real motive for the U.S. war in Iraq, which has some truth in it, while pointing to U.S. control of Syria's oil-rich eastern provinces as a key point of leverage against Assad, Putin, and Iran. While assailing Trump's comment at the Ohio rally, Rogan of the Washington Post argued that it contradicts Trump's own commitment to tearing up the nuclear agreement with Iran and otherwise confronting Iran throughout the region, a policy that, quote, must begin in Syria, close quote. It's pretty clear who the war party is here and who is uh, talking non-intervention, right? Congressional advocates of an all-out conflict with Iran were quick to criticize the suggested pullout from Syria. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, a leading Republican war hawk, declared in an interview on Fox News last Sunday that it'd be the single worst decision the president could make, close quote. Uh, Graham continued, if we withdraw our troops anytime soon, ISIS would come back. The war between Turkey and the Kurds would get out of hand and you'd be giving Damascus to the Iranians, close quote. So uh, Trump uh, once again shows the tendency that he showed in the campaign to contradict the war party that has been 
the source of the tremendous suffering in the Middle East uh, that the U.S. has brought to the region throughout this century. You're watching uh, We're on the Air. We have our colleague Karen Aram to thank for that last commentary on the case of Trump and Syria. AWARE is part of the anti-war movement, which has its roots in the anti-Vietnam War in the 60s uh, and continues today in spite of what some people say. Here's a comment by American writer and journalist Robert Bridge, uh, who's written a book called Midnight in the American Empire uh, and writes about the anti-war movement. Once upon a war, Americans waged large-scale protests against overseas military adventures, even helping to stop the Vietnam War. Today, the spirit of dissent has vanished, replaced by intensely personal issues. I think, in fact, he overstates here, but nevertheless, it is, uh, there's something to what he says. The first months of 2018 demonstrated that the protest movement in the United States is alive and well. In January, millions of women energized by the Hollywood-inspired Me Too movement, took to the streets of America to voice their displeasure at Donald Trump's first tumultuous year in the White House, as well as sexual discrimination against females. In March, another protest rocked America, as thousands of protesters, moved by the Parkland High School shooting, which left 17 people dead in Florida, assembled in Washington, D.C., in a call for stricter gun control. In the light of the disturbing frequency of shooting sprees in the U.S., it would be wrong to question the importance of, sense of such a movement. Yet however tragic is the sight of innocent Americans be slaw being slaughtered by some deranged shooter, those deaths pale in comparison to the number of innocent people being killed in foreign lands as a direct result of U.S. military incursions, many of them absolutely illegal, as in Syria. So where were the protests as illicit regime change operations in places like Iraq, Libya, and now Syria were systematically destroying the lives of innocent people? Where was the march on Washington, D.C., when Barack Obama, in the twilight of his bloodstained presidency, was dropping massive amounts of munitions on numerous countries, all of them in the Muslim world? In President Obama's last year in office, the United States dropped 26,000 bombs in seven countries, wrote Mike Zenko, the Council of Foreign Relations. Most, 24,000, were dropped in Iraq and Syria. How many innocent people, men, women, and children, had their lives snuffed out violently and prematurely from such a cavalier attitude towards war, we will never know. Nor did many people in the United States challenge their leaders on that question. The apathetic attitude on the part of so many Americans to this wave of death and destruction against foreigners and foreign lands suggests that any semblance of an anti-war consciousness has left the building. Once again, I think uh, this man overstates, but there is more than a germ of truth in what he says. For all intents and purposes, the Democrats and Republicans are essentially the same mind when it comes to the question of war. In short, it's a deemed an altogether positive event so long as few Americans die. In fact, the reason the liberals as well as factions inside of the Republican Party despise the maverick Donald Trump, who thanks to his own personal wealth did not need much outside donations, bribe money, to finance his presidential campaign, is because he threatened to end military entanglements overseas, thus depriving the military industrial complex of untold amounts of blood money. For anyone who doubts that statement, consider how the liberal media suddenly and sickingly became Trump's best friend after he unleashed a Tomahawk missile attack against Syria's Shayrat Air Base on April 7, 2017, the first time the U.S. military had attacked Syria's pro-government forces directly. As I said, the Syrian civil war had been promoted by the Obama administration by s financing and sending jihadist terrorists into Syria to try to overthrow the legal government of Damascus.
Fareed Zakaria, a political commentator with CNN, the U.S. news channel, with arguably the worst opinion of the U.S. president, uh, glowed in the afterburn of that illicit missile launch against a sovereign state, Trump's uh, attack on the Syrian base. Quote, I think Donald Trump became president of the United States last night. Zachariah enthused, enthused, hardly able to control his jingoistic juices. I think this was actually a big moment. Close quote. Not to be outdone, MSNBC anchor Brian Williams shaking his pom-poms for the defense sector actually called video footage of the missile strike beautiful. Quote, we see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two Navy vessels in the eastern Mediterranean, Williams said. I'm tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen, I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. And they are beautiful pictures of fierce armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield, close quote. Only at the end of that psychotic soliloquy did William venture to ask, what did they hit? Gee, maybe a school, a hospital? Apparently that was of secondary consideration for the journalist war booster, which strikes me as the ugliest oxymoron of all time. With this sort of sycophantic reporting and analysis behind every beautiful missile launch, is it any wonder the American anti-war movement is nowhere to be found? There's a real temptation to compare the current state of apathy and indifference of our day to the raucous Vietnam War era when the streets and more importantly the universities became the site of historic showdowns against the government. The high point of that protest movement came on May 4, 1970, when students at Kent State University came under fire by members of the Ohio, Ohio National Guard during a mass anti-war gathering. Four students were killed and nine wounded in the melee. Eventually, hundreds of university campuses around the country joined the movement that witnessed violent and nonviolent protests involving more than four million students. Compare that impassioned anti-war spirit, which seems right at home with institutions of higher learning, to the current sad state of universities. Today, students are actually breaking out in violent protest whenever some controversial guest speaker visits their campus to deliver a speech on a topic they find offensive. With this sort of aversion to debate and discussion, it's almost impossible to imagine the university being the source of an anti-war awareness any longer. There's also a bit of a helpless feeling, especially following the attack on Iraq in 2003 by U.S.-led forces and despite massive anti-war protests, that the people are powerless to affect any real change. What's missing is any sense of connection to the government, any sense it's ours or that we the people matter. And its place is the deepest sort of pessimism and cynicism about a national security state and war-making machine beyond our control. And why protest what you can't change? Once again, I'm not sure this is entirely clear because clearly the defeat of the outspoken warmonger Hillary Clinton grew out in part out of this anti-war spirit. And many, admittedly, many, much of the indifference to these military adventures could stem from the new nature of warfare. In the Vietnam era, for example, much of the fighting was done on the ground in the jungles, and many more U.S. soldiers were dying. At the same time, a military draft threatened to call up thousands of new recruits from the general population. In other words, many Americans felt a real threat, a real reason to protest the war. Much like the Vietnamese, their lives were at stake. The tragic irony is that today, with so much media and social media at our fingertips, we are better informed than ever. Yet we're discovering that the ability to access information, with the possibility of holding the powers that be to account for their actions, does not necessarily mean that it will happen. In fact, most people today, especially the youth, are so overloaded with information that what our military is doing overseas seems to be the least of their concern. After all, there are so many Facebook posts to check, so many selfies to snap, so many messages to tweet. In any ways, war is something that happens to foreign people, probably some terrorists, who probably deserve what they're getting. After all, America, the exceptional nation, would never attack innocent people for an imperialist agenda, right?
That's Robert Bridge writing about the uh, apparent absence of a contemporary war movement. As I said, I think he overstates it a bit, and I think, in fact, uh, he does not perhaps give enough attention to the degree in which uh, the public discussion uh, on social media and in mainstream media and elsewhere uh, is conditioned and controlled in ways that, uh, surprisingly enough, wasn't the case uh, two generations ago at the time of Vietnam. One of the sources of information uh, for us here at uh, News uh, Aware of the Air and other discussions of contemporary war has been the institution called WikiLeaks, uh, which has been extremely important in letting Americans know something about what their government is actually doing against uh, the tremendous wall of control that American propaganda uh, and control of the media uh, has instituted. WikiLeaks is important. Its central figure, Julian Assange, uh, is as a result of government persecution uh, a refugee in the Ecuadorian embassy in London right now, uh, unable to leave without being uh, uh, arrested and uh, pr prosecuted uh, for revealing secrets by the United States government. Uh, this is a comment by Slavoj Žižek, uh, a well-known uh, philosopher and writer, uh, entitled, Assange works for the people, now we need to save him. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, has been silenced again. The timing is most suspicious. With the Cambridge Analyt Analytica story dominating the news, it seems powerful people have reason to keep the brave WikiLeaks boss quiet right now. Cambridge Analytica is the uh, British-based group uh, accused of uh, mining data and making it available for propaganda purposes uh, for the Clinton campaign and uh, uh, many other uh, attempts to con other attempts to control uh, the discussion of uh, politics and war. Ecuador is a small country, and one can only imagine the brutal behind-the-scenes pressure exerted on it by Western powers to increase the isolation of Julian Assange from the public space. Now his internet access has been cut off, and many of his visitors are refused access, thus rendering a slow social death to a person who spent almost six years confined to an apartment in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. This happened before, for a short period around the time of the U.S. elections, but that back then it was a reaction to WikiLeaks publishing documents which could have affected the outcome of the Trump-Clinton race. Well, there's no such excuse now. Because currently Assange meddling, in quotes, in international relations consists only of publishing on the web his opinions about the Catalonia crisis in Spain and the Scripal poisoning scandal in Britain. So why such brutal action now? And why did it cause so little uproar in the public opinion? As for the second question, it's not enough to claim that people simply got tired of Assange. Rather, a key role has been played by the long and well-orchestrated slow campaign of character assassination, which reached the lowest level imaginable two months ago with the unverified rumors alleging how the Ecuadorians want to get rid of him because of his bad smell and dirty clothes. In the first stage of attacks on Assange, his ex-friends and collaborators went public with claims that WikiLeaks began well, but then it got bogged down with Assange's political bias, his anti-Hillary obsession, his suspicious ties with Russia, etc. This was followed by a more direct personal defamation. For instance, that he's paranoid and arrogant, obsessed by power and control. But now we've reached the direct bodily level of smells and stains. They say Assange is paranoid. How can anyone who lives permanently in a flat which is bugged from above and below, a victim of constant surveillance organized by secret services, not be? As for his being a megalomaniac, when the now ex-head of the CIA says your arrest is his priority, does this not imply that you're a big threat to some, at least? <laughs>
And the trope where Assange behaves like the head of a spy organization? But WikiLeaks is a spy organization, although one that serves the people, keeping them informed on what goes on behind the scenes. Yet, they say Assange is a refugee from justice, hiding in the Ecuadorian embassy to escape judgment. But what kind of justice is this which threatens to have him arrested when the case has already been dropped? So let's move to the big question, why now? I think one name explains it all, Cambridge Analytica, a name which stands for all Assange is about, for what he fights against, the disclosure of the link between the great private corporations and government agencies. Remember what a big topic and obsession the Russian meddling in the U.S. elections was. Now we know it was not Russian hackers, with Assange, who nudged the people towards Trump, but instead the West's own data processing agencies, which joined forces with political forces. This doesn't mean that Russia and its allies are innocent. They probably did try to influence the outcome in the same way the U.S. does in other countries, only in our case it's labeled democracy promotion. But it means the big bad wolf who distorts our democracy is not in the Kremlin, but walking around the West itself, and this is what Assange was claiming all along, the American propaganda system. But where exactly is this big bad wolf? To grasp the whole scope of this control and manipulation, one should move beyond the link between private corporations and political parties, as was the case with Cambridge Analytica, to the interpretation of data processing companies like Google or Facebook and state security agencies. We shouldn't be shocked at China, but at ourselves to accept the same regulation while believing that we retain our full freedom and that media just helps us to realize our goals, while in China people are fully aware that they're regulated. The overall image emerging from it, combined with what we know about the link between the latest developments in biogenetics, wiring the human brain, etc., provides an adequate and terrifying image of new forms of social control which, makes, which makes, the, makes the good old 20th century totalitarianism seem a rather primitive and clumsy machine of domination. The biggest achievement of the new cognitive military complex is that direct and obvious oppression is no longer necessary. Individuals are much, much better controlled and nudged in the desired direction when they continue ex to experience themselves as free and autonomous agents of their own lives. And this is another key lesson of WikiLeaks. Our lack of freedom is most dangerous when it's experienced as the very manifestation of our freedom. Because what can be more free than the incessant flow of communications which allows every individual to popularize their opinions and forms virt virtual communities at the user's own volition? This is why it's absolutely imperative to keep the digital network out of the control of private capital and state power, that is to remember it, to render it totally accessible to public debate. Hassan was right in a strangely ignored key book on Google, the book was called When Google Met WikiLeaks 2014, in his understanding of how our lives are regulated today and how this regulation is experienced as our freedom meaning we have to focus on the shadowy relation between private corporations which control our commons and secret state agencies. Now we can see why Assange has to be silenced at exactly this moment when the topic of Cambridge Analytica is everywhere in our mainstream media, this British group controlling this discourse. At a time when all the efforts of those in power goes into reducing it to a particular misuse by some private corporations, political parties, but where is the state itself and the half-invisible apparatuses of the so-called deep state? No wonder that the British newspaper The Guardian, which extensively reports on the Cambridge Analytica scandal, recently published a disgusting attack on Assange as a megalomaniac and fugitive from justice. Now, as far as they're concerned, write as much as you want about Cambridge Analytica and Steve Bannon, uh, Trump's advisor, just don't dwell on what Assange was drawing, Assange was drawing our attention to. Uh, 
that the state apparatuses, which are now expected to investigate the scandal, are themselves part of the problem. Assange characterized himself as the spy of and for the people. He's not spying on the people for those in power. He's spying on those in power for the people. This is why the only ones who can really help him now are we the people. Only our pressure and mobilization can alleviate his predicament. You're listening to Aware on the Air. We're talking about the nature of political discussion uh, in the world today, uh, and, and particularly in regard to the Internet and the vast attempts to make sure that Americans are not aware of the wars their country are carrying on around the world and oppose them. We have material from our, uh, director of res our director of research, Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson, uh, to turn our attention to now. And top of the list is the Skripal uh, stories. Uh, the Skripal stories refer to the poisoning episode, uh, if that's indeed what it is, uh, in Salisbury, England, involving uh, an ex-Soviet spy who was exchanged uh, years ago for other spies and has been living in uh, Salisbury, England, where it was suggested he was uh, attacked and poisoned, along with his daughter, uh, by forces uh, unknown, and uh, the British government immediately insisted that it was the Russian government, and indeed the president of Russia himself, who had done this, and on that basis there has been a furious diplomatic uh, contest between uh, the uh, U.S. and U.K. on one hand and uh, Russia on the other as to who can uh, throw out more of the opponent's uh, uh, diplomats. In the meantime, it looks like, as Dr. No says, the Skripal stories, yes, all the stories, are falling apart and we're not even one full month into this case. The stories are quite remarkable. They're trying to give an account of what actually happened. Uh, my favorite, I have to admit, is one rather well sourced from a bit British publication was the poisoning was an accident uh, involving organophosphates used in the Salisbury Garden of uh, Mr. Kripal. Uh, it's, it's, it's as reasonable as the other stories we've gotten from the government who are trying to make sure that we understand it's Russia's fault. There are also other stories that we should be paying attention to in regard to war that uh, uh, are not part of mainstream media, uh, including what's going on in Syria that we were talking about before uh, and how the uh, government account of the Skripal story is falling apart. Uh, it is uh, very difficult to get any sort of serious comment uh, on this matter that uh, the British and American governments are using to carry on their uh, war provocations, nothing less, against Russia. There are other things on the, in the media that are brought to our attention by our research task our research staff. Most important, uh, the program uh, programs put together by Chris Hedges uh, on contact on RT. RT is a Russian television uh, and news channel uh, that uh, is under severe attack by the U.S. Uh, mainly because it tells the truth. I find, I've got to the point these days that I read RT first before the American uh, equivalents or the BBC or France, uh, France 2 or the other uh, national news services like RT uh, because RT is more accurate. On contact with Chris Hedges interviews the economist Richard Wolff a uh, favorite of ours here for some time, on nothing less than, I quote, the coming collapse of the American economy, about what the massive and worsening inequality in America really means to ordinary Americans. This includes how work statistics, 
are gamed to make it look like there are a substantial number of people working and the figure is going up. In reality, the number of people with living wage jobs in America is low and shrinking. And this is the phenomenon, after all, that finally was what elected Donald Trump president uh, and is providing the uh, uh, deep fears of the American ruling class, the American 1%, that it actually faces a uh, revolt from a blow, a revolt, a revolt from below, a revolt from the majority of Americans whose life chances have been confiscated in the last generation and who understands their own circumstances to be declining sharply. Uh, and uh, that was what many of them understood uh, when they heard Donald Trump say, make America great again. And the reason, in part at least, that he's president. Meanwhile, Mainstream media is full of the fact that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, generally referred to as MBS, visits the U.S. and receives a glowing welcome, replete with visits from the wealthiest people in America, and publication of The New Kingdom, which arrives on newsstands last week, just in time for his visit. The New Kingdom is a full-color, glossy magazine promoting Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, the real Saudi Arabia beheads people, lashes people, and treats women horribly. Only recently did Saudi Arabia allow women to drive, for example. Where are the protests in the U.S.? We're told 37% of Britain opposed his visit there, according to the polls, three weeks ago. Aren't we supposed to be sensitive to the plight of women with Me Too and similar movements? The latter of the two links we have before us also lists Saudi Arabia human rights abuses, uh, courtesy of Human Rights Watch. Uh, the uh, glamorous presentation of NBS in this country is, of course, a testimony to the fact that the U.S. battle for control of the Middle East and its energy resources depends upon two major powers acting as uh, Washington's hands in the Mideast, that is Saudi Arabia and Israel. Uh, America's military control of the Middle East rests on these two countries uh, and the uh, surrounding countries which uh, are in alliance with them. But at the heart of it are these two uh, chief cadets, uh, Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and the effective ruler of Saudi Arabia is feted in Washington this last week. He's fed it as well, but I meant that he was celebrated. Um, I was talking about RT as a source for information that you don't hear in American mainstream media, and uh, the U.S. political establishment has recognized that too. The Kremlin said a week ago that taking RT off the air in Washington, D.C. looked both illegal and discriminatory. They've indeed done that. Uh, and it's uh, uh, a good a question is why uh, the uh, American government uh, has worked very hard to use the registration of foreign agents law from 1938 to try to control foreign media, particularly Russian media, uh, in America and the availability of those, immediate, those media to, Amer to Americans. Uh, I recommend that you make the effort to look at RT and compare it with what you hear on CNN, read in the New York Times, uh, and see on the front page of the Washington Post as well. You're watching uh, Aware on the Air. Uh, we have a uh, piece to finish up uh, with today that comes from uh, events of this last week. Uh, and. I think we will go to that in a moment. You have been watching Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group, in the 14th week of 2018, another week in which the world can see that the most extensive global terrorism is U.S. worldwide war-making.
My thanks tonight to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research. No's notes will be on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air, along with some of the articles I referred to tonight, and other things including Nicholas Baker's The Myth of the Good War, about the use of the Second World War to justify the crimes that the U.S. is committing around the world. We'll conclude tonight with a piece from the Real News Network, which I also recommend to you, uh, on the uh, events uh, in Gaza, or on the Gaza border this last week. Uh, the piece is entitled, Israel Massacres Unarmed Gaza Protesters Shooting 773 with Live Ammunition, close quote. Uh, one wonders how many other places in the world a unarmed popular protest resulting in an army opening live fire on the protesters would be ignored to the extent that this has been ignored in American media. The mil Israeli military brutally crushed a protest on the Gaza border led by tens of thousands of Palestinians, killing at least 20 people and injuring 1,400. Uh, there is a discussion of this coming up here on uh, Aware on the Air. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Liggett and Ethan Young and Andrew Scholarly, thanks to whom also this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. There will be an Aware meeting this coming Sunday, 5 to 6 p.m. at Hammerhead Coffee on the northeast corner or the northwest corner of campus at uh, University and Wright Streets. 5 to 6 p.m. next Sunday. It's an open uh, meeting uh, for people who are interested in the local anti-war movement uh, as so, insofar as AWARE means to uh, present it. Finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about but Americans don't, Manning, Assange, Snowden, and others, truth tellers persecuted by the U.S. government. Now, this is Carl Estabrook for Karen Aram, Karen Evans Levy, Stuart Levy, David Green, Ed Mandel, and other members and friends of AWARE, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck. Tens of thousands of Palestinians living under a suffocating Israeli blockade in Gaza organized a massive peaceful march on the border with Israel, and they were met with a sea of bullets. Israel crushed the historic protest with extreme violence, mowing down the unarmed protesters. More than 1,400 Palestinians were injured. The Israeli military deployed more than 100 snipers who shot 773 protesters with live ammunition. At least 16 Gazans were killed in the massacre. Israel's military later openly admitted that the massacre had been intentional and pre-planned. The IDF wrote on Twitter, quote, Everything was accurate and measured, and we know where every bullet landed. Soon after, it deleted these tweets admitting responsibility. The demonstration, which was dubbed the Great Return March, had been organized for months in order to demand the right Palestinian refugees have under international law to return to their homes, which Israel ethnically cleansed in 1948. The protesters also condemned Israel's decade-long blockade of the Gaza Strip, which United Nations experts have explicitly said is illegal. Because of this smothering siege, 1.8 million Palestinians are trapped inside Gaza with little water, food, and electricity. Even the United Kingdom's conservative former Prime Minister David Cameron has described the Israeli besieged Gaza Strip as a prison camp and open-air prison. The Real News spoke about the historic protest with journalist Max Blumenthal, who recently reported from on the ground in Gaza. This protest was also against the Israeli policy in the buffer zone where Israel controls territory inside Gaza and shoots people at will. But it was also about demonstrating uh, the legitimate claim that Palestinians have to their land and property inside Israel, according to UN Resolution 194. Um, you know, which was passed by the UN and gives Palestinians the right of return, which all refugees have. This, this uh, protest is the unarmed demonstration that we've heard a lot of liberal Zionist pundits call for over the years when they've demanded that there be a Palestinian Gandhi to rise up and lead 
uh, his people in nonviolent unarmed demonstrations. In 2011, at the height of the Arab Spring, or the so-called Arab Spring, Thomas Friedman wrote a column in the New York Times demanding that Palestinians embark on a giant peace march, a nonviolent protest march in Jerusalem to protest uh, the occupation. And he said that this march, if it was peaceful, uh, would immediately trigger a response in Israeli society uh, with gestures towards peace in Israel. Um, and that, that was an absurd column because um, these marches and this kind of tactic of unarmed resistance has been witnessed in Palestinian villages for years and years and years, and the world just turns its head and ignores it. And then these clueless figures like Thomas Friedman say, well, why don't they do that when they're doing it? And so they've done it again today uh, in a massive demonstration, very similar to some of the demonstrations we saw in 2011 by Palestinian refugees in Syria and in Lebanon. They just simply marched to the border and they were cut down by Israeli snipers. Uh, there's reports of Israel actually lobbing um, artillery with tanks into the buffer zone. And in the days leading up to this march, Israel was testing uh, drones that dropped tear gas from the air on protesters. Um, so this massive display of violence really shows Israel's response to the Palestinian Gandhi, which is uh, pure violence, no tolerance for it, and you know, complete silence from uh, mainstream American media. I've been sitting around watching CNN and MSNBC off and on today. And, you know, I get glimpses of uh, discussions about Stormy Daniels and Vladimir Putin's su global super bomb, but nothing about this. Legal experts say Israel effectively occupies the Gaza Strip, tightly controlling everything and everyone that enters and leaves. Blumenthal discussed the militarization of the Gaza border and the Israeli military's regular killings of Palestinians who enter a buffer zone Israel has unilaterally imposed. The border of Gaza that used to be covered with you know, barbed wire in some places back in the early 50s is now a gigantic concrete wall. Um, I was in Gaza a few weeks ago. I passed through that wall. It was the second time I entered. And I always look to my right as I'm walking through the buffer zone. Uh, between Israel and where people are allowed to live in Gaza. And it's about 300 meters. People in Gaza are not allowed to enter the buffer zone. If they do, they'll be shot by Israel. And they'll not only be shot by Israeli snipers, there's a remote-controlled machine gun that's permanently planted atop uh, that concrete wall. And it's operated from miles away by an all-female battalion of soldiers um, in the Negev Desert who are basically pushing joystick buttons and shooting anyone who approaches the border wall. While Israel's massacre of the Gaza protesters did get some attention in the U.S. corporate media, outlets frequently used misleading and ambiguous language to create a false equivalence between the unarmed Palestinian protesters and the heavily armed Israeli military. The New York Times described the one-sided Israeli slaughter of Palestinian protesters as clashes and confrontations. Blumenthal addressed the bias and hypocrisy in Western media reporting. Well, I mean, just having been inside Gaza and being in Palestine for, you know, years off and on, I mean, people do use the language of clashes on the Palestinian side. It's just part of the local language. Um, but if you're a Western reader, the language of clashes does obfuscate the imbalance in power because you have Israeli snipers with advanced um, sniper rifles, um, barrages of tear gas, those rubber bullets, and as I mentioned, artillery is actually being used against these protesters. The protesters do throw rocks, and maybe they have some burning tires, um, and sometimes I've, you know, I've seen them throw the tear gas back. So, you know, you can pretty much see that, the, that these aren't like equal clashes, but with two armies uh, armed with light weapons and tanks. It's, you know, youth with stones, but generally youth with signs and cameras and flags against, uh, you know, walking into the teeth of one of the most advanced militaries in the world. And so I do think that language um, obfuscates the situation. This is a massacre. It's very similar to the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa. It recalls the Mavi Marmara massacre. Uh, in 2010, and the massacres we witnessed on the Israeli borders with Lebanon and Syria of refugees attempting to march to their homes. And, uh, you know, worse than that, 
we heard that we saw the New York Times describe uh, the march this way, a peaceful march by Gazans to the border of Israel turned bloody. It just simply turned bloody. So we don't know if people inside the march started, you know, all of a sudden they pull out their, you know, machine guns and suicide vests. I mean, we just don't know because it just turned bloody. Actually, Israel turned it bloody by shooting them. And that's just too much for the New York Times to acknowledge. The Israeli government tried to justify its bloody crackdown on unarmed protesters by claiming that they were rioting and covering up so-called terror attacks by Hamas, the Islamist political party that was elected to govern Gaza. But Blumenthal argued the protest shows the exact opposite to be true. Well, when I was in Gaza, you actually saw uh, preparations already underway for some kind of march like this. There were protest tents set up, and every week on Friday there were demonstrations by local youth. Uh, basically, they would go to the border and throw rocks at Israeli soldiers, hold up Palestinian flags, chant. Um, so this was already kind of underway, and you know, over the years, these youth who have no affiliation with any faction, they're not Hamas, they're not being sent there by anyone, they're kind of just like independent. Um, they've been, they've been chased away at certain points by the Al Qassam brigades, which is Hamas's internal security and, um, arm and military arm. Um, you know, Hamas is the ruler of the Gaza Strip and they control what happens on the borders. So basically what happens here is, what happened here is Hamas has decided to kind of authorize what people in Gaza and Gaza civil society has wanted to do for a long time. And they've given them the, the latitude to march to the border. And that's, you know, that's really upsetting to Israel. It's really upsetting to the whole pro-Israel community. What this shows is that Hamas is embracing nonviolent, unarmed demonstrations uh, rather than embracing, uh, you know, the strategy they put on display in 2014, which is armed resistance. And, you know, this is actually more terrifying in a way to Israel that this technique, which really came from the grassroots of Palestinian society, has always been at the heart of Palestinian resistance, has been authorized by a group that Israel and its allies have attempted to define as this gigantic uh, terror threat. Under international law, millions of Palestinian refugees have the right of return to historic Palestine. The Great Return March on the Gaza border was organized expressly to highlight this fact. Blumenthal situated the demonstration in the historical context of the Nakba, the name for the mass expulsion of Palestinians in 1948. To understand why people are marching to uh, what's considered the border between Gaza and Israel, you have to understand what Gaza is. Um, Gaza is basically a human warehouse for refugees who are pushed out of their land and their property in 1947 and 1948 during the systematic campaign of ethnic cleansing uh, by Zionist militias and what, what eventually became the Israeli military. Uh, some 750,000 people were uh, turned into refugees in order to establish uh, the state of Israel with a Jewish majority. Um, a substantial number of those refugees went south towards Gaza um, which was then under the control of Egypt. And Israel proceeded to pass a series of laws like the Prevention of Infiltration Act, which defined all of those people who'd been pushed into Gaza as infiltrators and enabled their criminal prosecution and their capture, their violent capture, if they re-entered into what became Israel. Uh, David Ben-Gurion ordered his troops to shoot anyone who attempted to infiltrate again. And the Gaza border, ever since... Uh, you know, the early 50s has really been the site of, uh, you know, extreme brutality by Israel's uh, border guards against people trying to get back home from Gaza. Uh, here we are, 70 years later, and people are still trying to walk home. It's what they consider home. Blumenthal also highlighted the irony that Israel carried out this massacre of protesters on the beginning of the religious holiday of Passover which is meant to celebrate an enslaved people liberating itself from oppression. Tonight, uh, my family and friends and I are going to celebrate uh, what we consider to be a festival of liberation, the liberation of the Hebrews from Egyptian bondage. Um, and it's something that's really uh, 
you know, close to our tradition, not only as Jews, but as, you know, progressive people who believe in the liberation of all people. And it's really ironic to see a state that claims the mantle of world Judaism, claims to speak for all Jews, uh, not only, you know, obstructing the liberation of the Palestinian people, um, but it, but guaranteeing it with pure violence um, and rejecting all forms of dialogue. What the Palestinians are doing right now in Gaza, um, what these mostly young people are doing is they're calling on the world.